Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and with this video I'd like to talk about the design decisions that I've made with making a small blogging and ratings uh, piece of software for my website. Some time back uh, in, uh, I wrote in Perl a fairly elaborate system for blogging and for wikis. And it it was fairly uh, it as I say it was elaborate it was fairly complicated it supported supported multiple users it automatically synced posts to LiveJournal it had a command line interface for posting things alongside a web-based interface it had a lot of bells and whistles and for the last several years I've instead of blogging I've been active on Google Plus but for various reasons I'm thinking about uh, starting to do things on my own blog again and I would also like the ability to do my own ratings of various things and have them on my website and so I could just dust off the old blog or the old wiki blog software and add in some ratings functionality but I thought it would be interesting instead to use this as a chance to improve my skills with uh, with a language that I don't use very much. And there's a whole bunch out there. I'm a programmer uh, by profession, and so I do, I, I program in a bunch of languages, but typically uh, for languages which I don't, uh, don't know particularly well, uh, unless I'm, I need to do it for a job, uh, or unless somebody really grabs me for a project, I'm not going to build deep familiarity with uh, with a language and uh, so as, as mentioned my previous uh, wiki blog software called pound uh, it's uh, it's written in Perl and as a replacement for this I was initially thinking Python but I actually program a lot in Python and I teach Python so I don't really need to improve my skills in it uh, if I were going to do that, I might as well just do it in Perl, because Python and Perl are two languages that I'm quite familiar with and already can write big software in. I could conceivably use langu uh, a language like Swift or something, something like that, but I think my current leaning is to go with the, uh, the Go programming language from Google. It's a C-like language in a lot of ways. It's a fairly low-level language, and it's a language that a lot of people are writing system C software up to application-level software in. It's basically, if you take uh, a modern version of C, uh, take out some good stuff like semicolons, and add in good support for threading, which has always been kind of a weakness in C, and also provide some features that uh, that cover over some of the rough edges in C. Like with C, you typically didn't have bounce checked uh, arrays. And so that meant that fairly commonly in C, you would end up having almost any big pr uh, program in C have uh, buffer overflows because somebody would miss, uh, would somewhere miss some, uh, some checks or they wouldn't reason sufficiently about all the data that might go into an array or, uh, uh, like with null termination, you might somehow miss it with some weird string lengths, or you might end up writing over the edge. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and see if you're not just super, super careful, or if you don't use uh, one of a big, uh, a large number of competing libraries that attempt to smooth over the rough, uh, rough edges. It's just, it's a language that both intrinsically and because of the libraries that have grown around it, it's hard to code safely in. It's still a language that I love. Like, I've written lots and lots of programs in C over the years. Uh, it's one of my stronger languages. But uh, I think Go seems to have a certain amount of mindshare. And so I'm thinking that it might be nice to have this, uh, have this rating software and this blogging software written in Go. Now, I am probably going to import a number of ideas from... Uh, from Pound, my old Perl uh, wiki blog engine, um, because basically when you've written a web framework once, uh, you you learn a lot, and that's like a big reason why t uh, why these kinds of projects are useful. You get an idea for, like I'm I'm a systems programmer, so I have that kind of focus. 
Um, and there are other kinds of programmers, mobile programmers, uh, web programmers, and so on. And we all kind of have to work to understand each other at times. But if we've written some things that are normally in the domain of a different type of programming, uh, we we know a little bit more about what's going on there. And that's just broadly useful. The further along you are in a career, the more you should ideally at least have a reasonable understanding of the kinds of programming that you're not doing. So there are a number of ways that people could write uh, software in uh, in Go, uh, web software in Go. Um, it used to be that most people were using the Apache web server and they would use something called Mod Perl or Mod Python or uh, or something similar to that that you you basically write a chunk of code and the Apache web server uh, loads it and, and keeps it in memory and you can delegate certain portions of a URL to it. And that's what Pound was. Pound uh, in, uh, interfaced with, uh, with Apache using uh, Mod Perl. I mean, it's kind of the second level of uh, web software in that the first was the CGI scripts. The web server would run a piece of code when you, uh, or I mean, it would run a script or, or, or a binary or something when you were, uh, when you hit certain URLs and then whatever was output from that uh, got sent right to the uh, the, brow uh, the browser over HTTP. Um, and that was interesting, although it had performance limits. <coughs> uh, and so the, the second level, or the, I'm sorry, the second stage of how people wrote these kinds of software came about, where you would have a chunk of code living in your web server. Unfortunately, uh, although there is a mod Go, it looks like it's kind of dated, and I'm a little bit wary of building software that I write on tops of libraries of this sort that have sat idle for several years. <coughs> so I'm going with the third option. Uh, I think my uh, I'm going to write a standalone Go web server, uh, a very minimal one. And then I'll have uh, Apache proxy uh, particular URL patterns to it, which it's it's a workable design. It's not the only way that this kind of thing could be done. Um, fortunately, it gets me the kind of interface that I like when I'm writing web frameworks, and that basically I want to have a function uh, where I get the URL that was uh, that the uh, person put into their browser and then I write a dispatch function that decides based on what that URL is what to do about it and <clears throat> and so the I looked around on the uh, on the go documentation sites and I found a quick tutorial that uh, told you how to do this with a uh, go module called net slash HTTP and so that's that's what I'm gonna use. I, I looked at it; looks reasonable enough. Um, I guess there are still some things I don't know about it, like what kind of threading model does it use? Is it concurrent? How concurrent is it? But I'll find that out. And if it ends up being bad, then I might change uh, change what I'm doing. But for now, that's the plan. The other thing that you typically need for this is a some kind of a database to store the data for uh, for whatever you're doing. Um, I love Postgres. I've been part of the Postgres community for years. I've never seen any reason to move away from Postgres and actually I keep seeing more reasons to move to it. So that's what I'm going to use. Fortunately it looks like Go has uh, nice bindings for, uh, for, uh, for SQL engines. I'm going to use the database slash SQL binding and in particular, the lib slash pq engine for that binding, which is actually pretty similar to the way that Perl did it, because most of these things, they're very similar between one programming language and another. Um, so the next step that I, I needed to do was write a minimal proof of concept that would take a request and would consult a, dat a database 
and to spit out some <coughs> some content from the database to the user because if I have that then it's just a matter of adding conditionals and handling other things that I already kind of know how to do um, in order to make this uh, this software component and I did that it took me about uh, half an hour uh, to do um, some of it is learning how to handle uh, mime types with net slash HTTP. Uh, some of it is learning exactly how to use the uh, how to use the the Go uh, SQL bindings. But uh, I have a minimal proof of concept. It's not too many lines, and uh, I. I just loaded um, a small subset of the pounds database and I loaded some sample data from the script that I used to use to populate that database initially um, for people who theoretically were doing a new install of pound. And I have it uh, spitting out uh, a HTML document with multiple lines uh, just showing the output of a config table. So that's pretty cool. It means that I don't expect any huge technical blockers moving forward. And I feel that uh, with the sample code I have now, I can just keep evolving it until it does what I need it to and can keep pulling functions out into libraries. So the next thing that, uh, the next consideration that comes, uh, comes to mind is what kind of data, uh, how should I model this data? Looking back at my old uh, blog, there were some things I did that were kind of unique and many things that were really boring and vanilla that I really liked there. And I'd like to carry those forward into the new design. So basically this comes down to what is the information needed for a particular blog post? And how do I represent that in, in SQL? So let's start with the table first table would be a blog entry. Um, this isn't going to be a multi-user blog, uh, unlike my old uh, old blogging software. So a blog entry is composed of the time that that the blog uh, that that blog entry was made, the title, uh, the content, uh, any music that I was listening to at the time because I like to share that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think rendering preferences just in terms of I might want to support either having plain text entries or some kind of rich text I know that this is the kind of thing that later on when you're working on when you're uh, working on uh, on blog software you might end up changing how you do rendering and so I'm, I'm just going to include when I do a post what kind of rendering I expect it to do and this will give me the ability to change uh, to change the markup language that I'm going to use and initially I'll probably just do plain text because it's super easy to display I'll just filter out HTML, uh, HTML tags or render them in place as text so those are the things that are going to be in that table and with the uh, with the time field that means that I can easily do nice sorting uh, I might be might decide to do an RSS or Atom feed, something like that. Uh, the other thing that that's in a blog entry is a tag, so I can mark like these are some topics that I I think about. But the thing is, with tags you reuse them, and with SQL you don't want to stick re repeated data into tables. So that uh, so each tag name will uh, will. Uh, the tag names will go into a separate table, and then I'll have a linking table to link together uh, a given tag name and a given uh, blog entry. And so, bam, I, I think that that's all I initially need to do this. Um, the next thing is the, uh, the reviews. Now for the review site, I know that I probably will be reviewing books and places, a, a big number of different types of things. And so I think users might reasonably want to see those broken up by category. So I'll stick some kind of a review category table in there as 
kind of the route for how you find a review. And then I'll have some kind of a review object, like uh, a particular subway station. Um, I might actually do multiple reviews of a given station over time if the station changes, like if it starts becoming messy or, or somebody really cleans it up or something like that. So, but, uh, but so I'll have a review topic or type. I'll have a particular review subject and then I'll have a review. Uh, and there, again, there'll be possibly multiple reviews for a given, um, for a given thing. And a review needs uh, text. It needs probably some kind of rating. Uh, it might have a blurb, like uh, as a summary, which is kind of equivalent to a title for a blog entry. Um, I think that that's all I strictly need. So those are the things that are going to go into a review text table or something like that. And so the tables will link together in a fairly obvious way. And that's our basic data model. Um, I don't imagine initially that I'm going to support uh, logins on this site unless I just support a login for myself. Uh, so I don't really need a lot of accounting plumbing. I don't need to support different uh, CSS. My old uh, wiki blog engine did. Like if a user had an account, then they could decide I'd like it to be styled this way or that way. But again, this is trying to be a lot simpler. So I think that those tables are pretty much all I need. And so the next step for me is to write functions or to actually turn those into a SQL definition of each table, including all the foreign keys, including how they're all tied together. And I'll add, uh, I'll write some functions that are designed to, uh, to actually retrieve the data for particular things like get all reviews or get all reviews in order or uh, get last n reviews or get last n blog entries, stuff like that. I'll, I'll end up writing functions like that and maybe a uh, maybe functions to just retrieve a single review so that if I'm iterating over uh, a number of them, I can then pull, pull out the full review for display. Um, and I think that's basically it. Like it, it's not going to be a huge application. It probably won't be too difficult to write, but this is the kind of thinking that you typically want to do before you start to code. And uh, uh, I mean, y yes, it did happen after I wrote the proof of concept uh, and learning the language uh, kind of parts. But that was going to tell me whether this whole plan was uh, feasible with this kind of approach or not. And so you'll kind of develop these. Uh, I might not have to do this in the future if I write another piece of Go software and already know how this uh, this web library works, uh, this HTTP library works, or how this uh, SQL library works. Uh, but I need to do it this first time because I haven't really worked a lot uh, in Go before. Um, I mean, I've worked with it a little over the years, but it hasn't, I haven't done projects from scratch in it before. It's nothing big. So that's the design process for this. And uh, we'll see how it goes moving forward. And I just made this video because I thought occasionally, I, uh, I've taught people how to program. But I think one of the interesting things in programming is seeing how programmers think, how they start to approach problems. Because that's one of the things that often isn't taught. And uh, and it, so it leaves people, even people who have like the rudimentary t uh, beginning medium level programming skills, if they don't know even how to begin to approach problems, then their skills aren't going to be super useful and they'll only be able to pick up code that somebody else has started for them and gotten up to a working state. So I hope this has been useful or at least interesting. Bye-bye. Uh,